Hello, I'm Udayan Mukherjee. The Indian consumer goods landscape is undergoing quite a transformation. Once the domain of large corporations like Lever and Procter & Gamble and Nestle and the Dabbers and Maricos, today a lot of nimble and fleet-footed DTC or digital players are launching new products and attacking these corporations. At the same time, we've got a huge inflation problem and a cost of living crisis in rural India, which is slowing things down. It's a very interesting juncture then to be talking to the recently appointed chairman of one of India's homegrown FMCG powerhouses. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Mohit Barman, chairman of Dabur on the show today. Welcome Mohit and good to see you on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Of course, I mean, uh, you were appointed chairman of Dabur just a few months ago. And uh, I, I want to begin by asking you, when you joined Dabur Finance as a young man uh, several years ago, did you dream that you would be chairman of Dabur one day? Well, I mean, since then, it's been a huge transformation. Ryan. At that time, we were a family business where most of the family members used to work. Obviously, in the last 20 years, we've transformed into a professional organization where no family members work. So uh, we are basically on the board. And of course, because of the shareholding, normally it's uh, family members appointed as the chairman. So it's a non-executive role, but uh, I'm here to give it, uh, do it full justice. Mohit, what would you say is the kind of juncture that you have taken over as the chairman of, of Tabur? Uh, what significant differences do you see in the turf uh, as you t take guard for the next five years? Well, I mean, these are difficult times. Uh, inflation is at 10 percent and costs a lot of the raw material prices uh, as well as the commodity prices uh, you know, have gone up. Cost of production has gone up. But we're still seeing a growth in our business in terms of volume. Uh, although we, it's going to be difficult uh, to pass on all the price increases, so margins may be hit. But uh, I feel uh, there's uh, going to be a lot of potential in some of the newer channels of uh, uh, marketing and distribution, such as modern trade and e-commerce. And we are taking uh, advantage of that by launching premium products in the modern trade and the e-commerce where um, it would have been difficult for us to do that in the general trade. So there are advantages, but uh, I would say that these are difficult times. Mm. Uh, the greatest difficulty seems to be coming from the rural market where Dabur has been a very strong player traditionally, but we can clearly see that that market is not firing at the same rate as the urban market now. And uh, there are even signs of down trading in many products. Uh, how persistent do you see this rural slowdown being? You're right, uh, right. The last uh, the last six quarters, we've seen uh, uh, the urban market growing at a at a faster pace than the rural market. So we are facing a little bit of a problem there. But uh, we are coming out with smaller pack sizes, more value-added packs. We are coming out with uh, different. Uh, product ranges which cater to the rural market and I don't foresee the I don't foresee the problem to last too long I think it'll recover in the next few quarters hmm. if I asked you to guess would you say the next one year would be tough for the rural side or do you see the problems getting resolved before that but the next two quarters are going to be tough but um, I think after that we'll see uh, we'll see a better uh, situation so I think maximum one year and these modern channels that you spoke about, uh, you know, for, I mean, the general perception is that this is a threat for incumbents, large companies like yours. Uh, but you, from what you said, you seem to seeing, uh, seem to be approaching it like an opportunity. But what exactly is your strategy on the DTC platforms and, and the new way of selling consumer products? Well, see, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of innovation that can happen in, um, in, a, in, in these sort of uh, outlets. Uh, you know, we are able to uh, produce premium products. Uh, we, can, uh, we can test market uh, variations of existing products like uh, different uh, varieties, different uh, honeys with flavors. Uh, we've launched peanut butter. So there's a range of products which we can launch in these uh, distribution channels which then, uh, depending on whether they accept it or not, then roll it out in the general trade. So it is, uh, it is an avenue which uh, we are 
experimenting with, but I think it has a lot of potential. And would it be organic, your strategy there, or are you ready to pick up or cherry pick some of the interesting brands which have come up or mushroomed in the last couple of years? I mean, would there be a strong inorganic element to Dabur's strategy here? Well, we have, uh, I mean, so far in these channels, we have an uh, organic uh, play which we're, which we're focusing on. I mean, uh, as you know, we've recently acquired a, a mainstream uh, spice business, uh, which is uh, a blended spice company called Bacha, which, uh, which is uh, very focused in the Western uh, region, which we plan to uh, take uh, nationally. Now, Bacha is an interesting acquisition, uh, Mohit. Is it also a kind of an admission of the fact that it's the food and beverages business which is probably looking more exciting at this point than the traditional beauty and personal care business? Well, we, you know, uh, I, it all depends on where the market is uh, at that point of time. During the COVID, during COVID times, we saw a huge growth in our Ayurvedic health supplement healthcare range. And now that things are back to normal, uh, we are seeing more growth in the foods business as people are going back into the market and the general trade is opening up. And if you look at the spice business in India, it's very fragmented. It's, uh, it's, uh, you don't have a strong national player. It's very regional based. Each state has its own preferences. Each, uh, uh, as you know, uh, the cooking methods, uh, the taste palettes, all different within India. So there's a huge opportunity. Bacha is strong in the western region. They're strong in Gujarat, Maharashtra, Andhra. And we are planning to take uh, the products national. Uh, at, this, at this point, we've taken a majority shareholding. So we've kept the management team back to show us the way on how to develop this business and what are the preferences that we can capitalize on and and make sure the research and development gets stronger so we can have products that that have national acceptance what's the potential with this acquisition uh, mohit uh, if you're able to successfully extend it to say the southern part of the country or even the north and the east uh, what kind of size could a brand like Bacha masala become in the next five years but the whole spice market is 25,000 crores and Bacha is uh, at this point of time only 250 crores. So I think, I mean, we have, a, we have a Accenture doing a strategy on this and hopefully we'll be able to double the turnover in the next three years. What about the rest of the foods uh, business, Mohit? Give us a sense of what your, where your trust would lie in the F&P business. I mean, so far you've been a strong player in the juices business uh, and some other pockets. But if you look at the F&P portfolio holistically, what would be your trust areas? You know, we're focusing uh, basically on uh, in niche areas where we can add value. Uh, we have a now we have a very strong uh, product in our in our natural coconut water, which as uh, which is accepted globally. So we are the market leaders in in packaged coconut water, and uh, we're experimenting with yogurt-based drinks, milk-based drinks. So we will continue to expand and innovate our food and beverages um, portfolio. But um, and uh, with this Bacha acquisition, we will grow. Um, uh, we will try and grow the actual spices business uh, to become a national player. And how is the personal care business doing in these inflationary times now? I mean, are you able to protect margins or given the level of competition in that space, uh, it is inevitable that you will have to sacrifice margins in the near term? Yeah, that's the case. So uh, commodity-based products, uh, like uh, like pro coconut oil where we have a brand called Unmol, you know, facing hair oils, facing inflationary pressure, uh, highly competitive. You can't pass on uh, you can't pass on all the cost. Uh, so we have to absorb that. Uh, we are you know of course coming out with uh, pack sizes, but uh, that is that is a problem area. Uh, but uh, growth is still there. I think uh, I think margins were correct as in when the uh, the commodity prices uh, go back down. But are you able to maintain market share in most of your key categories compared to say even I mean in large players like the Maricos yeah. of the world, yeah. but also new entrants like Mama Earth, etc. Are you able to consolidate and grow market share? 
Yeah, actually, our market shares have been increasing in our in 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 the product categories where we are dominant. So, in things like in in products like Chavan Prash, in 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 honey, uh, our actual market shares, toothpaste, our market shares are actually increasing. So, what what is your focus going to be now, Mohit? I mean, when you talk to your uh, executive CEO, do you see yourself tiding over this phase with pretty much the existing basket of products uh, or do you see yourself extending and growing through product innovation and new product launches or even new categories? So as of now we are going to focus and put uh, adv our advertising dollars behind our power brands. Uh, we, are, we are innovating as we've, uh, we have a bunch of products that, uh, uh, that as I said we've launched in the modern trade and the e-commerce so that innovation is always something which we believe in. But uh, at this point of time, we want to consolidate and make sure that over the next two quarters, our power brands, um, you know, reach uh, their, their growth rate, which was their previous uh, to previous COVID times. Time for a quick break on the show, but we shall return with Mohit Barman, chairman of Dabur, after the break. Tensions are rising between China and Taiwan. Since Nancy Pelosi's visit to the island, China has broken into Taiwan airspace more than 20 times. If a war is unleashed, Taiwan is likely to fall short against China. Here's a look into China's five most powerful weapons that can set the tone if there is a war. Number one is China's hypersonic glide missile. This is a DFZ-7 model. It is a precision strike weapon. It is capable of delivering nuclear weapons. This weapon can be fitted to various Chinese ballistic missiles. AG-600 is the world's largest seaplane. It can operate on ground and water. It is 129 feet long and has a wingspan of 127.3 feet. The seaplane speed is 500,000 per hour and its range is 4,500 kilometers. China has 15 of these landing ships. They are amphibious in nature. They can carry up to 30 attack helicopters per dock. Its length is 778 feet and the beam is 118 feet. There is not much information on the stealth bomber, but it has a range of 8,500 kilometers. It is nuclear capable and can threaten US targets. This weapon is said to be under development. Golden Eagle is an unmanned airship. Since China has a lack of pilots, this breaks their way. It can fly at a speed of 100 kilometers per hour. It can stay in the air for up to 6 hours. Its length is 50 feet and the height is 16. Welcome back. You're watching the Business Today show. I've been in conversation with Mohit Barman, the recently appointed chairman of Dabur India. Now, as the promoter group of Dabur, Mohit, I mean, what is your approach to this business? Do you see Dabur as a kind of a cash cow, which might even finance some of your other interests that the group might have, because you have fingers in many other pies as well? Or is the core focus really the listed Dabur India? I mean, just give us a flavor. I mean, now that you're not active hands-on managers of Dabur, but more mostly shareholder directors, what, how, how do you approach your basket of businesses? Yeah. yeah. So we keep, uh, I mean, the family will keep on giving strategic guidance to, to, uh, to the management of Dabur. I mean, we are the, we are, we are, we are the majority shareholders, uh, um, not uh, by a small uh, pie, but uh, a large. We own 67% of the business, so therefore the board uh, the board consists of four family members, and therefore Dabur will always be our core holding. I mean, as for the other businesses, 
as you know that um, uh, family members now are the next generation is coming in so there are there are a bunch of other businesses like which we have in the healthcare space some in the financial services space in the qsr uh, space where mainly in the b2c businesses which will obviously need capital to grow and we'll provide that uh, um, uh, apart from dabur do any of these businesses have plans of being listed separately i mean other than the flagship dabur uh, india which is listed at any point in the next 5 years could any of the other businesses be headed for an ipo well we just acquired a listed business which is ever ready industries which is one of the oldest companies in india um yeah. we historically had a second listed company called dabur pharma as you know um as of now uh, we have uh, we have two yeah. so we have two insurance companies uh, one in the life space with aviva one is in general space uh in um god universal sampo we have a qsr business um uh, taco bell so uh, i think uh, i think it uh, the uh, as you know the sports team punjab kings so some of them are, are close to uh, reaching critical mass but um in terms of listing in the next one or two years uh, that'll be a little difficult for me to answer not even taco bell because qsr seems to be doing very well uh, mcdonald's is listed uh, dominos is listed uh, you have no plans of yeah. uh, expanding that franchise yeah. or even thinking of some kind of a local listing yeah so um, there are now four or five listed companies in the qsr uh, space as you um there's uh, there's safari there's devani there's uh, mcdonald's best life um jubilant with the uh, dominos and we are we, we are scaling up that business we are the master franchisees of taco bell uh, it's a uh, it's a brand owned by yum restaurants who own kfc and pizza hut as well so we are we are we are putting a uh, lot of capital and we are opening one a week and i think uh, i'll be should in the next uh, 18 months reach critical mass and then we will be able to evaluate whether we are open for a listing or not okay Tell us a little bit about Everready and what you want to do with it. I mean, it's an old brand, it used to be owned by the Khaitans. Uh, they probably took a wrong turn or two at some point. Uh, but you know, it's a brand which is well known across India. I mean, where what do you see yourself? I mean, as, as the prom- new promoter group doing with the brand and extending it? Well, I mean, there's uh, in the last 10 years there's been uh, a 1% CAGR, so you can you can kind of you see that the uh, it's actually shown no growth, but it's uh, but look at the resilience; it still has uh, uh, a 52% market share. So I believe that you know it needs. uh the zinc it's it's uh, it's the market leader in the zinc but uh, in the more expensive alkaline category it trails behind you yourself so our first uh, our first goal is to actually put money in the alkaline business uh, grow the distribution put some marketing spend behind it and fight yourself uh, in the alkaline business after that we will expand the business to the other uh product categories which it already operates in which is lighting torches rechargeable torches and 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 grow and market those businesses only after we put all these businesses in line in the growth phase then we will look at uh, entering into any new product categories but do you recognize the potential of ever ready uh, to become something like i mean you know companies like havels call it fast moving electronic goods i mean eventually once you've stabilized the ship could ever really be the launching pad of something as big as that yes so that is our intention we've got bain to uh, to work out a, a strategy for us a long term strategy so as soon as we're able to put the house in order and uh, we will look at different product categories and 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 look at expanding uh, ever ready into into a larger uh, product um, Uh, category uh, kind of uh, in a more holistic uh, as you call it uh, fast moving electronic goods let me let me ask you about the financial part of it because that is where you cut your teeth bohit in dabur i mean the insurance yeah. business the asset management company businesses which you were quite involved in in the early stages are you happy with where you have reached with that or do you think you could have achieved much more since you had the cash to back it and these are such fast growing areas all of them yeah so 
You know, we at that time, we took advantage of uh, the economy opening up. I mean, there was a lot of opportunities in the financial services industry where multinational companies, you know, wanted to come to India. So we took advantage of that. And, you know, we obviously knew that we weren't the experts to manage those businesses. So most of them were done in joint ventures. And, you know, we've, we have a life business. We have a, we have a non-life business. Our asset management uh, mutual fund company with Fidelity um, got sold because Fidelity wanted to exit, so it's been a it's been a bunch of uh, businesses uh, which some have uh, some have succeeded and some haven't. So I think we've learned uh, that uh, in a lot of these businesses, uh, if you do tie up with uh, some uh, you know global brand names, then it becomes uh, essential that they are focused uh, and believe that India is of strategic importance, and uh, and a lot of them have actually. Uh, not done well only because the the, the multinational has decided that uh, you know India is uh, is somewhere they don't want to be in, but the ones that have actually uh, been and stayed doing the long haul are, are doing very well. So, do you see some restructuring necessary at the uh, with the financial holdings out there? I mean, could you sell some off, grow some of them, even list some of them? Because it seems like a bit of a kind of a jumble yeah, out yeah. there. So. Yes, but because we haven't, we haven't, uh, we haven't done it through one holding sort of structure. All the investments have done, been done separately. So, uh, so uh, we we're going to keep them separate because, as I mentioned, uh, the, most of them have several different joint venture partners. So it's uh, it's not possible for us to put it under one sort of holding company. Uh, we recently uh, divested uh, our life insurance business uh, from a majority to a minority stake. Uh, we, it was a 51-49 joint venture with Aviva UK, and now it's a 74-26. So we uh, uh, we divested there. We got some money there in our in our general insurance business. I, it's a JV between uh, uh, two banks and a Japanese collaboration. I think uh, that business will be ready to list in maybe um, one or two years. It's called Universal Sampo. Uh would you say it is a fair assessment to say that uh, the Burman family has a opportunistic kind of a lens uh, while looking at very diverse businesses? Because your core knitting is FMCG, but sometimes in the past you've bought stakes like in companies like Punjab Tractors, which you sub uh, subsequently divested. Uh, do you approach businesses in that sense that whatever comes up, you're willing to take a punt in it? Uh, even if it's not related to your expertise and experience? I would say that was the case some time back because uh, in the past uh, we looked at uh, opportunities as, as, as investments. Uh, however, over the last few years we are, we are, we are, we are decided no, that we are not going to take minority stakes and only concentrate on businesses where we can add value. So it will essentially be in the consumer healthcare space and where we will have significant control. And therefore, you see our whole portfolio move from minority investments in businesses where we can't really add value, but to majority positions and control situations like, like ever ready now. Before we end, I mean, I want to talk a little bit about what your um, personal ambitions are like. I, I read that you're very fond of theatre. Is that correct? Tell us a little bit about it. No, I mean, that, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in England, so it was something was uh, that I was passionate about. I still, you know, make few trips. I, you know, I make I make trips to uh, to the Shakespeare Company in Stratford upon Avon, and uh, and whenever I'm there, I I try and soak in a couple of uh, plays. But uh, and even in uh, even in India, when I get an opportunity, uh, I was just invited uh, in Bombay to, uh, to the NCPA. So uh, I'd say it's, it's a passion which I've had since a young age. And who are the business leaders or peers that you really admire? I mean, over the last few years. Who, who are the people who have really left a mark on you? Well, I'm not sure about a mark. I mean, I learned most of my business uh, acumen to, uh, to senior family members uh, in my family, whether uh, it was uh, my father's family, the Burmans, or my mother's family, the Malotras, uh, who was the HL Malotra, was the blade entrepreneur who, who ran the razor blade industry for many years in India. But of course, I admire many other leaders. 
You know, I read books. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm an admirer of Warren Buffett. I'm an admirer of Ratan Tata. So I think it's a, it's a mix and match of uh, of uh, of, uh, of a number of people. Well, Mohit, it's been great talking to you. I wish you good luck with Dabur and Everready and all your investments. And thank you very much for taking time out for us today.